Hello and welcome to another episode of Skin Like a Rhino, the podcast by Elvi, in which I, Tanya Bowler, get to meet some of the awesome women who are breaking old taboos and new ground in women's health. In today's episode, I am delighted to welcome Helen O'Neill, who is the founder and CEO of Hertility, which is a new digital service which allows women to understand their hormones and health in a completely new way. As well as Hertility, Helen is also a lecturer in reproductive health at University College London. Helen, great to see you again. I think we first met about three years ago when you were just starting Hertility and I'm excited to delve into what you've been up to and, and also to share with the audience around, you know, really about hormones because it's something I think we all as women talk about uh, and think about but we don't necessarily understand uh, in any sort of detail and, and no one better than you to help us talk it through. Um, but I know your, your first passion was very much in genetics and women's health, is that right? Yes, very much so. I think that's my one true love. <laughs> But how, uh, you know, even for me working in women's health, I don't think I kind of understand how genetics do affect women's health. What role does our DNA play in, in how we feel about ourselves as women? Well, we have two X chromosomes. Um, and the X chromosomes are the largest chromosomes that we have. And a Y chromosome is very small. Um, which is, no, I'm not saying anything, but a Y chromosome is very tiny. And a male has an X and a Y chromosome. And that means that in every single cell of our body, we're physiologically and in a, on a cellular level very different, even down to, so I um, study embryology in the early formation of a human being. And there's, you know, this even this theory that a female embryo develops slower than a male embryo because it's got an extra X chromosome to shut down. And there's that even that me mechanism of doing that means that we're impacted in so many different ways. And we see this reflected even in cancer genomics and our predisposition to certain disorders. So if we think about women's health, some of the issues that women specifically go through, be it age of first period, through to fertility, through to menopause, are those all quite determined by our genes, by our DNA? So much about what we experience, who we are, how we experience pain, how we display um, physical um, characteristics. I mean, I'm, I am a geneticist, but I'm also almost like a control, uh, a control experiment in itself because I am an identical twin. And I think that maybe was the key to giving me an early interest in genetics is that I had a far earlier acknowledgement of what genetics was from such an early age because I had this identical being that was next to me that you know we we had so many exposures um and it makes you think about life in terms of your exposures versus your underlying genetics and i think of both play a huge role but sometimes people don't necessarily under understand maybe and therefore underestimate the role that genetics plays in in everything yeah, I hadn't thought, I suppose, the identical twins, because that's a sort of the ultimate experiment, isn't it? In yes. terms of nurture versus <laughs> yeah. nature. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, for example, fertility, like uh, the ease at which a woman who wants to get pregnant, is that, would that be similar for identical twins or is it also affected by lifestyle? Well, I think with fertility, it's a, it's always a difficult question to answer because unless you're going to do the, do the experiment mm -hmm. of using the same oh, sperm, yeah. which might be controversial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we can only... At the same time. Yeah, exactly. We've only got 50% of the equation, so yeah. we carry 50% of the DNA, but the sperm does carry 50%, so you need to kind of understand that in order to truly control that experiment, you need the same <laughs> sperm, which I don't know. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody up for it, not me. <laughs> um, and also the other factors that determine our fertility lifestyle plays a huge role. Um, but very rarely do people have the true, ex true identical exposures mm -hmm. throughout their lives, um, even through dietary means. And that, that does play a big Im impact on our fertility. But broadly speaking, if we think about fertility in terms of egg, egg reserves mm -hmm. and, and that sort of side of it, that's predetermined. We do. Is, or? Yes, we do see. So we do see that people who have whose mothers have gone through early menopause, they too will start to manifest earlier um, symptoms mm -hmm. of you know, menopausal symptoms. And they're aware that their mothers went through this. And I'm always fascinated when people come to us and they say, um, I'm just I'm just really interested in this because my mom went through loads of IVF before she had me. And then we're saying, do you maybe think it might affect you too? And then, yeah, it's reflected in their results that they too have a low ovarian reserve. So I suppose it's a very positive move, right? Because it's all about a more individualised approach. I know that's what fertility is all about. Because if you read certain tabloid newspapers or so, and there's a sense that women are fertile and then suddenly at the age of 35, they just yeah. fall off a cliff. I mean, surely it's 
There are a lot of individual differences to your point. That's Women exactly need to understand their family history or, and or, I don't or do think, tests. Yes, exactly. And I think so many people cling to a number or cling to an age and they'll say after 35. And then you always get this rebuttal of people who are, you know, saying, well, my mum had me at 40, um, bearing in mind they've had a very different life to their mother. Mm. Um, or then it really on it is unhelpful to those who are, you know, 25 and thinking, well, I've got 35 seems like a lifetime away and it is. Um, and yet they are the ones for whom low ovarian reserve is is affecting. And and when we look at a a large database of women, we do see this, like there's a whole reason that statistics lie on this kind of classic bell curve. Like there's the Mm -hmm. outliers, the people who and naturally got pregnant in in their 40s. And there's the other side of the outliers, which are the people who couldn't get pregnant in their 20s. And we assume that everyone's going to fall in the middle. But actually, there are many, many individuals on either side of that outlier curve that are affected. And they, you know, they're hopeful for the statistics to be in their favour. We all are. We're all very unrealistic when it comes to to statistics, we think. Even when it's, you know, one in six, one in six heterosexual couples are infertile. And most people think, probably not me. And I suppose for me, I mean, we, you and I work in similar areas, right? Yeah. So we both work in quite taboo women's health issues. I think we both have the same, some of the same values, which is also around education being mm. key to, to making better decisions about your health and body. So I've come, I know I'm from that more extreme view. So I often test myself. I want to know where I am. But I also realize a lot of my friends uh, don't seem to be, don't know that they can test or don't know mm. what to test for. Is that, sort of, is that part of the problem, isn't it? The fertility is trying to face. And why is it that women... Do you think there's a sort of hurdle to women understanding their bodies or they just don't even know what they need to know? I think it's a twofold thing. Number one, there's never been really access. And that's Mm -hmm. why, I mean, for for me, imagine doing um, a a master's and then a PhD and then doing a postdoc and doing research into women's health and then lecturing about it and thinking, how is it that I can lecture master's and medical students about fertility? Every single up to date study that's been done and carried out on a wide range of subjects and yet myself I have no idea where to turn for answers and I thought that's pretty messed up that I have this connection of clinicians of doctors of gynecologists and I didn't actually know where to turn and that to me was a real moment where I thought if I'm struggling to know where to find answers then how does anyone else even start um and that to me I think is is it like I said a twofold problem number one it's that we there's nowhere there has classically been nowhere to turn and number two we're just not educated about what are the things we should look out for in fact it's the opposite we we almost make things worse for ourselves by the fact that the only education we receive as women is to tolerate put up and expect pain bleeding and to, to the to the point where women don't really know what an irregular menstrual cycle is And if they do have an irregular menstrual cycle or debilitating pain or heavy menstrual bleeding, the first thing that is done is instead of finding out the underlying root cause and testing somebody's hormones, they're put on the pill or a form of hormonal contraception. And nobody is incentivized to come off hormonal contraception if the reason they've been put on it is to prevent really painful periods, heavy periods, um, mood alterations, weight, skin, acne there's no real day where you say you know what today's a good day to bring that back Mm -hmm. into my life and so the majority of women who approach us have been on their form of contraception for 15 and so what's actually going on because those do sound like quite familiar symptoms so for women listening who are suffering with irregular periods or heavy periods and so on you say what what are those root causes when you say we should be testing our hormones what what would a more ideal pathway look like i suppose um in the first instance we we know that our endocrine system is very well connected everything is signaled um and i always i always talk about our our hormones and i give the example of uh hormones that we so flippantly speak about but actually rarely understand or or give a moment for the true power of like adrenaline right everyone talks about adrenaline kick and getting an adrenaline but actually think about the power of what adrenaline does so you could you could literally see somebody and it would cause your stomach to drop it makes your heart rate faster Mm -hmm. it makes you sweat it makes you lose your speech these are tangible physiological things that are happening as a result of one hormone being released and that could be so so flippantly activated through seeing somebody or something happening or hearing a noise that you get a fright and we recognize that 
profound change it has on our body. But our reproductive system and our our ovaries, our uterus, our um, thyroid, our pituitary, they're constantly signalling to one another because very unrealistically, our body expects us to get pregnant every single month. And so we're so susceptible to our surroundings and therefore, when we're under stress, when we are um, over exercising, under eating, our body from a basic evolutionary mechanism says mm, this this isn't actually the best place to host a pregnancy. So very often your um, your ovulation will be irregular or will be suppressed by high cortisol and stress. You will um, skip a period like everyone mentions that when they're um, over exercising or under eating or they're really stressed or they're sick, their period is either late or doesn't come. And that's your body's way of saying not this month. You Mm -hmm. need to preserve all energy for you. And so it's not just one hormone when it comes to our overall reproductive health. It's about checking your thyroid, your reproductive hormones, your ovarian reserve, of Mm -hmm. course, because it's directly linked with what stage of your reproductive life you are in, whether it's, you know, mid 30s to mid 40s and and perimenopause is is starting to kick in. the, The power of our hormones goes so far beyond reproduction, despite our you know, desire to only think about reproductive hormones being important for reproduction or contrac- the opposite. Let's let's, mm-hmm. let's never get pregnant. So let's put us all on contraception. But we know that estrogen, for example, is is directly linked with bone health, cardiovascular he- cardiovascular health, um, neurocognitive health. So they play significant roles in in our overall well being. And so mm-hmm. checking in on all of them is to me vital. God, I mean, yes, so much to delve into there. So why is it that women aren't getting the information and that, that you're sort of describing where we're looking more at the root causes? Is it because there's not enough gynecologists in this country? Is um, it because GPs I think it's a, an inherent trained? misunderstanding of women's health. Mm-hmm. Um, when we look at so many of the symptoms, as I mentioned, they're quite insidious, you know, either feeling mm-hmm. tired or putting on weight or feeling cold often. They're all directly linked to our hormones and yet we all feel tired and hungry and fat most of the time you yeah. know we're we're all struggling a little bit with our lifestyles and and our, our go-to like people like to blame doctors and say why aren't they um why aren't they diagnosing women but we're the first person to disqualify ourselves and say that's probably nothing I'm probably fine. And I'm smiling because it reminds me so much actually with, with LV Train, our first product, Pelvic Floor Health. It's a similar idea that when women have a baby, it's just normal that they're not going to be able to laugh without, you know, accidentally really? weighing themselves yeah. or jump. They're not going to be able to jump on a trampoline anymore. It's this idea of we're a woman and we just have to put up with these. It's the normalization of symptoms. And, yeah. um, and that that message that is, you know, just put up with it. You mm-hmm. are a woman. It's very hard. It's very hard to quantify um, certain things, the amount you bleed, how, what pain, they're very subjective. I mean, mm. the amount you bleed isn't subjective, but when we're given measurements, you know, upon guidelines like a teaspoon, <laughs> you know, that's not really helpful when you're hemorrhaging and you've soaked through your trousers. Those aren't things yeah. that you can quantifiably say, um, maybe that was a maybe that was a soup spoon, actually. Um, um, yeah. And I suppose there's also certain medical conditions, right, which are causing... Uh, problems for women, be it polycystic ovary syndrome or endometriosis, are those things that you also test for? And, yeah, we, and how so, do you look at that in terms of women's reproductive health? So we wanted to build something that screened women for any possible thing that could affect their reproductive health. Um, I think the geneticist in me was like thinking of all the what ifs. Mm. So what, what if somebody had congenital adrenal hyperplasia. I think that probably <laughs> it's probably led me to really search too too much to an extent. But my frustration was looking at some of the pre existing data that we already have and thinking, hang on a minute, this was the study that informed clinical guidelines mm. to diagnose a condition and it's carried out on thirty women. Like these are the terms by which we accept a, a poorly controlled study at best and yet they're set, you know, considered seminal papers. In so you saw a lack of data. I remember actually the first time we met, that's what you told me with yeah. fertility. It was about there's no data. We need just more data, right? Yeah, we need more data. And, and I remember just thinking like, what is going on that we expect? You know, them saying there's, there's a lack of data and thinking that's not really an excuse. And with conditions, for example, like PCOS, which affect one in 10, um, 
repeatedly seeing them being described as um, elusive conditions and thinking there's nothing elusive about a condition that affects one in 10. Start asking women, you know, start studying them, start including them in clinical trials. But yeah, we just don't, we just, we don't have the the same level of investment um, into women's health, sadly, as you know. And just maybe just zooming out a little bit for those who are thinking about getting pregnant, as you said, we often have like a quite superficial understanding of the hormones. Will you just talk us through very briefly what are the key hormones uh, that women should be thinking about with fertility? You know, what do you test? I, I, you mentioned egg reserve as well. I'm guessing that's the AMH test. Yes. And people, I think, know oestrogen the most, right? That's the one people yes, talk about Yes, I think everyone most. talks about oestrogen mostly because it's been weaponized um, as if, you know, mm. east, we're, we're full of oestrogen and that makes us weak and vulnerable and will make us cry despite the fact that oestrogen is a very potent and powerful hormone that, like I said, it has roles in our bone health, our cardiovascular health and our brain health. But... People are, people are... Oh, it's so almost negatively. Like, yeah. Well, well, I we guess, have more testosterone than oestrogen anyway. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, testosterone, oestrogen, um, then your thyroid, um, which it really is like your thyroid is like the master regulator of your whole uh, hormone system. And then AMH, which people talk about. We never measure AMH on its own. So your anti-malarian hormone uh, or AMH is a hormone that's secreted by each of the follicles in your eggs or in your ovaries so in our ovaries we have loads of would-be eggs and every single month we produce hormones that mature one of them in the hopes that one of those eggs will be released and fertilized and so that's fsh which is follicle stimulating hormone it's literally stimulating a follicle and that that rises in the first half of our cycle so that we can try and mature one of the eggs and hope in the hopes that it's released now because each of your eggs or would be eggs these immature eggs that have yet to be matured um se- secrete amh or anti-malarian hormone it's a really good indicator of the relative abundance of eggs that you have so we can really um we can really look at the relationship between our fertility and our AMH. And so it's actually quite a powerful proxy for our overall fertility. If somebody has an AMH below one, they really don't have a good ovarian reserve compared to somebody who has an AMH over 50. And then I guess there's that, there's the other side of the trend, you know, that that over 50 would probably be somebody who's polycystic. So they have multiple, um, multiple would be eggs. And I think Again, the terminology is obviously misleading. We all need to understand which is our biology. So yeah, I think we could we could definitely do with normalizing some of these terms around the basic everyday functions of our bodies. And and more than normalizing, I mean, you use the word weaponized. That suggests mm. there's a very strong gendered element here. Like, what's you know, reproductive health or, or fertility has always been used as a weapon too, right? In terms of women um, being expected to produce. And, and it always felt to me historically that the onus has been on women's responsibility to, to reproduce. I mean, how do you look at that sort of in the, in the cultural context here in the UK or in the US? And, yeah, Because we ignore the role of men, right? I mean, even if I were to challenge you, the name Hertility suggests it's... Is yeah. that to do with women and fertility? And yeah, I guess it's her Would fertility. you also provide services to men? Yes, we will do, definitely. Well, good. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely. The uh, yeah, I, I feel very passionately about some of the words that we use, yeah. um, and, I, and I don't underestimate weaponized. I, there's there's a lot. There's an incre- I wish I could think of the author, but there's an um, an incredible paper that's written by a medical anthropologist, and what they've done is they've looked through all of the examples where in medical textbooks we use words that undermine everything to do with the female physiology. So, for example, menstrual waste, menstrual effluent there's we we all have been you know almost taught to use words that kind of associate something negative whereas you know at there and a, you see in this in the same textbook like an abundance of sperm in the ejaculate and you just say oh, and this and, and a woman only produces one egg and you just go well Hang on a a minute. The egg is the largest cell in the body. The sperm is the smallest cell in the body. Could we not reframe this narrative here? And you could say that how, how... how inaccurate that you have to produce 60 million sperm per milliliter just for the hopes of one getting in. And yet we have this almighty one powerful egg. And yet none of the wording is framed to be positive around women and it's very subtle when you start to read into it you realize how much of it really exists yeah and you could say not just in medical journals but everyday language everything's do with like have you got the balls to do this there's always very positive associations yeah don't be a pussy 
Exactly. And then also in the, in the, in the news, right, the fact that it's constantly about women over the age of 35 falling off a fertility cliff where yeah. we're not, I don't think we're seeing as much around men and sperm quality and so on. I mean, if we look at infertility, how does it generally split across causes by gender or, and or by couple? It's amazing when you look at the history of this. I mean, traditionally, it was looked at that f- fertility was a female problem and infertility was especially a female problem. She failed to get pregnant. She lost the pregnancy. She didn't get pregnant. She couldn't get pregnant. It's always, you know, it's, you'd never say he, he was, he was yeah. shooting blanks. And, um, and the ratio of infertility blame, we'll say, used to be like 100% female. Then it was like, maybe it's 10% male factor. Okay, maybe it's 30%. And now we're witnessing it's about 50-50 male to female factor. And and actually, because we're all waiting so late, none of us are our prime candidates to be reproducing. <laughs> so actually, both are really not in, in the best position in there. You know, now we're seeing average ages of mid-30s where we're actually... That's exactly it. We're, we're not really best, the best biological candidates for reproducing. So what's happening on the male side? Like, What are the main sort of causes of infertility from, from the male side? For any men, men in the audience yes, who are exactly. worried about their sperm quality, what, what should they be thinking about? What symptoms and, and how can they even get tested? Um, so we've seen actually in the last... Fi- it's actually quite staggering what's happening to men's health. In the last 50 years, we've seen a 50% reduction in the average sperm count. So we really... Just the number uh, of sperm. Yes, yeah. The per sheer, milliliter. Per milliliter, yeah, exactly. I mean, That's you huge. might say 60 million per milliliter with an average ejaculate of three mils is a lot. And st- yeah. Is we that know, for all age groups? Or? Yeah, yeah. From even younger men? Yeah, we're seeing um, earlier onset of erectile dysfunction in younger men, probably to do with, you know, excess porn. But male fertility levels generally are dropping. And a lot of it has to do with just our environment, um, exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, Our lifestyles really are not conducive to um, being healthier. I think the exposures that we have. um, And and even when you look at... But what sort of thing, just to understand a bit more on the lifestyle side for example on the lifestyle side, I th- we have so much more access to um even it's certainly within the uk this high um the high number of people eating ultra processed mm. foods um it's just become normalized that people would eat ultra processed foods then drinking the the amount that of alcohol that certainly young men drink is way in excess of what is what is normal or healthy. Um, just routine exercise, we're seeing lower testosterone levels. We're seeing so many more men supplementing with tos- testosterone, um, and testosterone is produced by your testes. Here's mm-hmm. me using my hands, um, and 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 therefore people who are you know taking exogenous testosterone, their their testes basically say, "Well, I don't really need to do this anymore." So it's a very dangerous. Um, area to get into but definitely people don't talk about men's health and the fact that male sperm counts are really dropping. Yeah. What sort of chemicals are there that's causing this disruption? Is it literally in our water something we have out of our control or is it things that we should be thinking uh, about, men and women? In truth, it is out of our control. Mm. Um, endos- endocrine disrupting chemicals are found in almost 90% of people now and it's to do with the fact that not just our water, it's in everything. When people are talking about microplastics and the role of plastics on the environment, everyone is so consumed with what plastic is doing to the planet and you see images of animals, which it does have a a really negative impact on animals. But when we talk about microplastics, it's not about ingesting a plastic. It's about the fact that these plastics contain phthalates and bisphenols they're they're known as forever chemicals because we can't get rid of them it's very depressing I don't know, I um, this is incredibly depressing please tell me there's something we we can or should be doing or is um, this yes i think we um they always say children and uh, women are have higher level of um bisphenols and phthalates because women use cosmetics and babies chew children chew plastic i think it has much more to do with nappies maybe sanitary products but the fact but i definitely think cosmetics have a huge role to play so many of them contain really awful chemicals that we just shouldn't be putting on our skin our skin is an or- organ that is is digesting and so, so cosmetics and then sanitary pads have these chemicals well, and we need to look for there's, there's, are there any websites or anything which kind of explain yes there's a and i think i, have, I, I need shares in this company yeah. there's an app there's a web call a website called or an app called think dirty and think you can dirty. put in uh you can scan even you can put in a product and it will tell you what percentage dirty it is and it's quite harrowing to see some of the some of the products that are labeled you know you know moisturizers for for babies and they've got you know they're all in the red for some of these 
um, neurodevelopmental um, and just toxicity factors mm-hmm. that you just think, how does this get to market? <laughs> I just don't know. I mean, I don't want to obviously alarm and shock shock people to, to overly panic, but just the stat that you were saying in terms of sperm count going down 50%, yeah. are we seeing uh, a similar detrimental impact on women's fertility? And are we able to even scientifically show that it is linked to these environmental factors? I'm guessing from a scientific point of view, it's also quite difficult to prove, isn't it? Well, you can... You can actually correlate it uh, quite a bit. What we've se- what we have seen is that global um, onset of puberty has become so much earlier in certain certainly in certain areas. So where the average onset of uh, puberty used to be, you know, 12, 13 in certain areas now, it's eight and nine. If you start menstruating and ovulating and releasing eggs earlier in uh-huh. life, then what we are we are witnessing now, the downstream effect of that is that women are experiencing menopause earlier and we're still because they only have a finite number of yes, eggs exactly. right that's right we're yeah. born with all the eggs we'll ever have so um that reduces over time so all of this points to the need for women to <laughs> better understand, understand where they are earlier yeah. yeah so at what age should women be thinking about getting the hormones tested i think that everyone should test when they're 18 yes. um in truth legally we can only test people once they're over 18 because mm-hmm. we can't test somebody who's a, who's a minor um but actually, I would love to see the data from 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, that, that earlier ages, because I have no doubt but that girls who struggle in their teenage years are the same who struggle with their fertility, who struggle later on. But we just suppress it by putting them on hormonal contraception. What sort of struggle? You mean periods? With irregular periods, painful periods, mood, mm-hmm. depression, anxiety. Rather than us investing in understanding the underlying causes of, you know, pubertal irregularities and finding out whether they have a downstream effect on our fertility and later on, are we are they the same candidates who then really struggled through perimenopause and beyond? Nobody's built that longitudinal data set. So while I, while I say everyone should test from the age of 18, actually, I would love to be able to look much earlier than that and really map women over time. That's part of our, that's part of our ongoing research is to say, you know, once you're 18 to 25 to 35 to 45 are the same types of exposures um, that one person has, lead, uh, those that lead to uh, the same symptoms. Are we more likely to develop pathologies, hormonal imbalance, thyroid imbalance based on our lifestyle factors, based on, based on our menstrual factors? And that's, I mean, fertility was built to build predictive algorithms for determining somebody's relative risk so that we could just help people out with personalised advice as opposed to generic you know, bell curve advice. I suppose that then leads to question which which people, uh, women often ask me about, I think particularly in reproductive health, which is around egg freezing, right? Yeah. I feel like, again, that's an area where there's a lot of media hype. Some of it can be quite negative and positive, but then maybe not so much understanding on how effective is it, what sort of age does it work? Because I sort of hear occasionally that maybe women are leaving it too late. Does it need to happen earlier? Yeah. Where do you think egg freezing sort of falls within your different range of options as a woman? So egg freezing is a really amazing way mm-hmm. of... It's an amazing way of uh, taking your own reproductive autonomy and, and reproductive control into your own hands. However, it's become different. Um, now it's being advertised, pushed, incentivized, paid for by large corporates. It's become yet another thing that women have to do. Um, there's there's many a body of thought that says it's yet another way to control women, to keep them working until we can send them off uh, to have children. But egg freezing is, enti- the success of egg freezing is entirely dependent on the age with which you freeze your eggs. So People don't really associate their lifestyle factors prior to freezing their eggs, but you should be preparing your body for egg freezing as if you were preparing for a pregnancy and ensuring that the when I mentioned that we have all of these eggs in our ovaries and that we have follicle stimulating hormone that stimulates just one in order to release it. When someone goes through egg freezing or IVF, same process, mm-hmm. the average age still is, I think, 39 for freezing eggs, which is simply too late. So what should the average age be? Um... It's hard to pick an average age, I think. Especially when um, we're saying we shouldn't be thinking about averages. I suppose no, what you're saying is women should test the AMA. That's exactly it. And then based they on should, the number of eggs, they can then make a decision on whether or not yes, to Yes, exactly. It's eggs. so much more than just your egg reserve. It's also to do with your personal life 
situation sometimes people come to me and they're like I'm married but I don't really know if we're going to do it and I'm like just do it you're married <laughs> other people are like we've just broken up and there's no way I'm going to find somebody be able to have a normal enough relationship and procreate with them in, in the time that I need and then you think go for it freeze your eggs give yourself that you know reproductive autonomy and freedom to say okay maybe I can actually have an enjoyable relationship without the pressure of do you want to have a baby yeah uh, can we have baby soon and then I suppose just shifting gear then slightly to we've talked a bit about you were saying how different things like nutrition and exercise affect your hormones mm. for women who are not thinking about fertility or menopause but through every other stage of a woman's life how is the reverse relationship so how might hormones be affecting things like how we're putting on weight or how we feel about ourselves physically or our metabolism are, the, are there things that women should be how should women be thinking about their hormones during during periods which are not related to menopause or fertility I think just every single menstrual cycle, we witness this enormous impact that our hormones and the cyclical nature, so the changing nature of our hormones have on us. And so it's well recognized that, you know, towards the end of your cycle, when you're about to get your period, that, you know, that that's your luteal phase, I call it the low teal phase, because you've got low estrogen, you're really struggling. Progesterone has a big role. It impacts so much of our mood, our metabolism, our sleep. And yet we don't really educate or arm ourselves to say, okay, well, I do. I do. Um, I expl- I, my first caveat when I meet people is I'll tell them what space of my cycle I'm in so that we can, <laughs> I'm full follicular today. So um, when you are in your follicular phase, for example, when you're ovulating and your estrogen is really high, it's, a, it's an, I, I always think of us as being very basic evolutionary creatures. So when your estrogen is high, when you're about to ovulate, that egg is going to be released. You are fertile and mother nature wants you to procreate and to create a life and is very optimistic every single month that you will do it. But as a result, because of this link between, you know, we've twice the number of estrogen receptors in our brain. It impacts how we think, how we feel, how we behave. We have higher confidence levels. Estrogen is linked to our collagen. So when you have higher levels of estrogen, you, you physically look better. She's doing everything she can to get you pregnant. And the converse of that is when that really drops during your luteal phase right before you uh, menstruate, you have such low estrogen. And I always say to people, you know, if you had if you had to do a job um, that required a lot of thought and brain power and you needed to do it at three in the morning, you'd prepare yourself. You'd give yourself a little bit of mental leeway. You'd forgive yourself a little bit too, yeah. saying, OK, it's the middle of the night. Maybe this isn't my best work. And yet we don't do the same. You see hu- such a huge difference between night, literally like the night and day um, from one end of our menstrual cycle to the other. But we don't really allow for any of those allowances. We don't forgive ourselves um, and say, do you know what? I'm a very luteal. Maybe today is not the best day to figure this out. Yeah, Jump well, forward to perimenopause. I mean, we are seeing be good to just understand a little bit what are the hormonal changes there and and and, and how and why are we seeing more and more women taking estrogen and even testosterone replacement yeah so during perimenopause when i st- i started mentioning that you have this hormone that's produced in each one of your eggs your amh that drops considerably mm-hmm. over time until you are in menopause where you have zero amh you have no eggs left right so that's the direct link is that it's your ovaries are no longer producing the hormones to release an egg and what we have to remember is that in the absence of having those hormones that does have an impact on our body, um, there are many for that, that believe they don't want to introduce any hormones into their body, each to their own. Um, I do think that there are many um, physiological impacts that our body uh, withstands when we are without oestrogen. Mm-hmm. Going through perimenopause is that journey into menopause. Mm-hmm. really don't give enough weight to the impact that it has on mm. overall health. If you look at the top three killers of women globally, it's osteoporosis. So when one in two women will fall and break a bone, it's cardiovascular. We have uh, we have cardiovascular disease and or it's dementia. So t- two thirds of all cases globally of dementia and Alzheimer's are women. And it's because of yeah. this, you know, that we and have hasn't there just been a recent study showing that HRT does reduce the risk of Alzheimer's? Yes. Yeah. And I think in the UK and the US, it feels like um, you know, with everything in women's health, I always think about you need the education side and then you need the technology and the solutions. 
in menopause at least some of the taboos have been broken people are talking yeah. about menopause here in the UK much more openly with I think leadership from a lot of celebrities such as um, Davina McCall Mariella Frostrup and I've seen a similar trend in the US but it's still an area where I think there's still a lack of understanding on the hormonal side and I know it's an area which fertility is about to go into so I'd love to hear what you'll be planning in this space and why it's needed. Um, we are really planning on just building data, um, data that informs better practice. The guidelines that exist around um, whether how to essentially diagnose somebody going through perimenopause or menopause and what they they many of them say that you shouldn't test anybody's hormones at all Mm. in order to do that that it's solely based on somebody's symptoms they actively say that yes so but why because your hormones are constantly fluctuating however um if you could get an idea of your baseline Mm -hmm. then you'd understand what your decline might be and for me in the absence of data to inform we shouldn't make a guideline Mm -hmm. a guideline should be based of data to inform that practice. Now, if you were going to replace somebody's hormones, you would think that you'd understand what and to what extent you're replacing them. Um, it's To me, it's normal titration in, in an experiment, um, albeit that it, it does fluctuate. Why don't we allow women to monitor over time and see what are the doses that, that suit them better? We are- Basically, what you're saying is nobody's testing what your hormones are. Nobody really knows what you need or, or when or anything. It's just more like, do you have hot flushes? And if they go away, that's fine. Yeah, with, with HRT. Yeah, it's, which is pretty crude. Much of it is pretty crude, and when we're still using the same excuse, which is there's not enough data, and I think it's time to just start collecting some of the data to better inform future decisions. Even- Am I right in understanding when women think about HRT, they're basically talking about estrogen, and that even though more and more people are talking about testosterone replacement, it, that's not standard practice to be prescribing. Like, What is the role of testosterone during menopause and, and how important is it for women to be thinking about that? So for HRT, it's usually, it's either combined, which is progesterone mm-hmm. and estrogen or um, estrogen only, but you'd only have estrogen if you've had a hysterectomy, so your womb removed. Um, testosterone plays a significant role and yet because there are no studies to show and there are no derivations of testosterone that have been built or formulated for women, that is the reason why it's not prescribed. It's uh, it's not legal to so prescribe. There's no studies. There's no, there's no formulations though... of testosterone that have been derived from women yeah. to give to women. The only um, the only commercially available testosterone is is male testosterone. And just also for just for the listeners, what are, what are the sort of symptoms of, of low testosterone in a woman? You see low mood, um, low libido. Um, there are strangely enough, there's a lot of overlap between some of the symptoms that nobody really can pinpoint for for any. Like we know with men, for example, when they have low testosterone, it actually affects their um, their adiposity and their fat deposits. It affects their bone health, their mood, their mental health, their sleep. But we often just associate testosterone with um with yep. sexual arousal uh, in men, but it has also significant impacts on their overall health, and it's no different to to women. We we mm. require it for um, basic physiological functions and not just sex drive. So, well, as I think I mean, if there's one message I've picked up today. It's you know, hormones just affect so many different aspects yeah. of our lives, and it, it goes way beyond what we always think about. I think with estrogen and progesterone, that there are so many other hormones. Obviously, the sex hormones, and then as you're talking about adrenaline and so on. Yeah. I mean, looking to the future, what would what would a world look like in in your vision where we had all the data and we could therefore create new technology? What 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 would How would things be different? Oh, I think everything would be different. Number one, women (laughs) would be in control um, because we are more in control (laughs) of ourselves. Um, To me, I would love to be able to have dedicated centres of excellence that are ongoing, that enable us to better inform so many aspects of our lives, whether it's how to eat at a certain point of our cycle, how to better... um, how to better predict different symptoms, how to relate what they mean to us in everyday lives. When we look, unfortunately, at the current state of women's health and maternal outcomes, as as many women died in 2022 as they did in 1922 in the States in childbirth. And that tells you how far we have to come. So Mm -hmm. when you say in in 100 years, where would we be? I would think that we would be not back in 1922, which is where we currently are in terms of maternal outcomes. There's just so much work to be done. And I think that is where we can start to use up, be be advocates for our own health, take our own health into our, our hands and stop being told that our symptoms don't mean anything and not, not need a license or a 
a sign off from someone to get information about our bodies, to be able to do it mm -hmm. from the comfort of our homes. And that's that's really what I wanted from Hertility was to be able to say, can I be an advocate and an expert in my own body in the absence of needing anybody else? A great vision. So in, in that world, there'd be close to zero maternal mortality. Yes. Women would have sort of full, yes. I suppose, less unintended pregnancies, yes. more intended pregnancies. We would better understand the normal physiological workings of our body. We are so unbelievably powerful as beings. And even the way when we talk about, you know, pregnancy, it's the paint, the picture we paint of a pregnant woman is somebody who's sweating and out of control and tired and, you know, huge rather than this incredible being who has created yeah. life. And then the postnatal picture we paint of women is, you know, milk everywhere, hair a mess, rather than this, you know, this incredible being who has nurtured and grown and is now feeding from her body a human life. I don't know, women, women need a rebrand. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, actually with Elvi, that's one of the things that has really been incredible to see because we redesigned the breast pump, which was this negative experience. And now women are using Elvi pump and they can get on. Yes, I, I used yeah. it. <laughs> and you can see on our social Insta, women are like, look, they literally like, look at me, I'm a superwoman. Yes, I, I remember. I running felt like a Marilyn I'm Monroe. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm creating breast milk for my baby. Yeah. Uh, and I love that. And Helen, I think, you know, you and I, we're working in very different areas, but sort of very much on the same mission and yes. excited to work together because it's so much about, uh, as we said, giving women the technology, the options, and also just changing attitudes so they yeah. feel more positive. Making the jump to be an entrepreneur, there must have been so much learning along the way. And one of the things we always talk about, uh, hence the name of the podcast, which is Skin Like a Rhino. Uh, and I know particularly women's health, there's so many people sort of up against you or saying this is not possible and so on. Um, it'd be good just to share a little bit about how did you find that transition? And at what moments have you really had to sort of dig deep uh, in terms of forging your way forward? Uh, it's very interesting to that people assume that academia and entrepreneurship are so very different. Um, but you, as an academic, you have to prove your point. You have to try and sell your research. You have to try and get money through research grants and you have to convey the message. And all of those are the same attributes that are required for entrepreneurship. You have to prove your point, mm -hmm. sell your product, make presentations, and you definitely need to, to pitch for money. It's just that the, quant the quantum is, is very different. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been... To, to me, I, I think I, I couldn't have done one without the other. Um, it gives you the tenacity and the grit to keep going in the face of rejection. But because you do it because you, you care so deeply about the problem you want to solve and you will do anything to find answers. And no, it's no different when you have a startup that you truly believe can transform the world. You'll do anything you can to get that message out there and to build something to make change. Helen... I mean, not only do you have two incredible jobs as an academic and as an entrepreneur, I know you're also a parent. So um, just you're just absolutely awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining <laughs> us today. It's been absolutely wonderful to be learning so much. Thank you so much, Thanks Helen. So it's much. been a pleasure. Great. Thanks.